important part of learning how to meditate is learning how to play with your meditation. For example, you're focusing on your breath. You want to learn how to play with your breath. And there are some very important reasons for this. Because what do you do when you're playing? You're trying out new things. You're enjoying the fact that the mind can create something and can think of new ways of doing things. You know, there are different approaches to playing. Some people say you just play totally without any rules. And there are some games that you play without any rules, but a lot of games have rules. In fact, the more rules, the more fun the game is, the more of a challenge. And when we're playing with the breath, there are certain rules. The whole practice is a matter of playing. There are certain rules that you play with. And the satisfaction comes in learning how to master the rules, play within the rules, and yet still play. Play well. Of course, here what you're winning out, you're winning out over your defilements. You're winning out over greed, anger, and delusion. But the important thing about playing is that you're not doing something just out of drudgery work. They, they say that people whose work doesn't challenge them, who doesn't, that doesn't inspire them, those are the ones who are most likely to get Alzheimer's. The brain isn't engaged. Playing requires intelligence. That's why that article on the physical genius included not only surgeons, but also musicians, sports people. Because it takes a certain type of intelligence in order to play well. And it's precisely that kind of intelligence that we're trying to develop in the practice. It's not the intelligence that can memorize things and, as my, one of my teachers used to say, vomit them back out on a, an exam. It's the intelligence that sees problems and that can work with them. sees problems that other people didn't see, but then also sees connections that other people didn't see. How a lesson that you learned in this part of the practice can be applied to that part of the practice. And then you test it to see if it works. That's the kind of playing we're talking about. Because after all, what is the Buddha's teaching about a set of strategies? Strategies for Gaining happiness, given the fact that there are certain laws that govern the way action leads gives results. The laws are a little complex, they're not mechanical, and that's what makes them challenging. That's what makes them you want to rise, makes you want to rise to the challenge. After all, it is your happiness that's at stake here. And you look at your life and you already have certain strategies for becoming happy. Our whole sense of self is just that. It's a strategy. You learn to identify what things are worth looking after, what things the well-being of certain things is more productive of happiness than the well-being of other things. Having a sense of self also teaches you to deny yourself certain things now so you get better results on in the future. It inspires you to practice. It inspires you to get skillful at things. That's the positive side of the sense of self. It reminds you that you're responsible for your happiness. You can't sit around and expect it simply to come to you. That's another positive side to the sense of self. And in the practice, we're encouraged to think in that way. The passage I referred to last night, spurring yourself on to the practice because of a regard for yourself. Seeing yourself as overcome with aging, illness, and death. And wanting to put an end to that situation. That's the predicament in which we find ourselves. And if you didn't have a sense of self, you wouldn't see it as a problem. Or you wouldn't have any idea how to go about solving the problem. So your sense of self is a, an important strategy. 
But remember, it's just that. It's a strategy. If you try to dig around and find anything of lasting value that you can really identify, ah, yes, this is myself. If you look at it too carefully, it starts dissolving away. But you use it when it's a useful concept, when it's a useful strategy. And then after a certain point, you begin to take that strategy apart because there's a more subtle strategy that leads to a more subtle happiness. But in both cases, if you can learn to play with these concepts to see exactly how far they're, they're good and where they're no longer useful as strategies. That's when the practice really, really gets into you. Because the things that you play with are the things that are really close to your heart. Because after all, what is your heart? It's, on the one hand, it's this ability to fabricate. On the other hand, it's this, the experience of the pleasure or lack of pleasure that comes from the fabrication. And it's right there that you're going to look for Awakening. It's right there that you're going to look for the deathless, right in this ability to fabricate and the question of how much your fabrication is helping lead to happiness. The path is something you fabricate. So you learn how to play with the path within the strictures that are there, within the rules that are there. Like with any game, you've got to stay within the rules. But within the rules you find there's a lot of latitude. What kind of meditation object works best for you? That's something you've got to find out by playing with the different objects and learning how, learning to see, learning to see which object you enjoy most playing with, the one that you keep coming back to, coming back to, because it sparks your imagination. And John Fuling told the story of a John Goma complaining to John Lee, how can you meditate on the breath? He says, that's just in and out. That's all there is to it. And John Lee says, if that's all you see, that's all you get out of it. But John Lee saw a lot of other things. And you look at his Dharma talks, and he continued exploring the breath all the way up to his, the end of his life. He was always finding new things, new ways of looking at the breath, new ways of playing with the breath energy, new ways of strategies of conceiving the breath energies to help the mind settle down quickly and have it stay there for long periods of time. Seeing the wandering mind that goes around and gets itself in trouble as a problem, but also seeing that you've got this potential you can work with the breath in different ways to get the mind to settle down, to get it engrossed in the present moment. And what is more engrossing than play? And some things you, you play with them and after all you lose interest. You seem to take them as far as they can provide entertainment, provide results. But with the breath you can keep exploring here, exploring there. And then as you get more intimate with the breath, you find you get more intimate with the processes of the mind, the thinking, the directed thought and evaluation. Play with those. See how subtle they can get. See what level of well-being they can give. What level of gratification they can give in the present moment. The word that John Fuhrman would also often use is "try this, try that." Try this approach. In the same way that a coach would say, "Well, if that." That way it doesn't work. Well, try this. <clears throat> Encouraging you to start thinking on your own. If you try that, it doesn't work. Well, maybe there are other things that you can think up, or other approaches you can think up that'll work. And it's important that you engage this, the inventive side of your mind as you meditate. But again, learning how to do, use that inventive side and so that it's not just wandering off in abstract imaginations, but it's actually applied to what's going on right here, right now. Put it into play as part of your practice. Because what we're doing is learning where true happiness comes from. 
and true happiness is not going to be dull. So that level, you've got to keep that level of interest up. And so this is what it comes down to, the things that you like to play with. Because you see that on the one hand there are certain challenges that you run up against. And there's the other side of you that's up for the challenge. So well, how about this? How do you get around this problem? How do you get around that problem? Play wouldn't be fun if there weren't rules you run up against, certain facts of life you run up against, and you find them challenging. So you've got this mind that's creating suffering for itself. It's busy concocting things all day long. See that as a challenge. How can you take that process of concoction, the way the mind fabricates this, fabricates that, and turn it to better uses so it actually does provide happiness? That's the challenge we've got here. We use the breath. We use the things we learn about the mind as we stay with the breath as ways of responding to that challenge. We get directions from the books, we get directions from the teachers, but a lot of the play comes from just that, playing with this idea, playing with that approach, playing with this strategy. See what works, what doesn't work. If it's not working, what can you do to adjust it so it does? It's inquisitive side of your mind that's going to lead to discernment. The people who aren't inquisitive, those are the ones who get stuck in concentration and they don't want to move. But if you're naturally inquisitive, you can make a game out of learning how to bring the mind to settle down. Once it's settled down, it'll naturally want to understand this, understand that, understand the process of what you're doing. So these are qualities you want to bring to the practice, you want to bring to the meditation, the ability to play, to respond to challenges, to be inquisitive. to find something here in the present moment that engages your imagination. Again, it's imagination and work applied to what's a genuine problem, the fact that you're causing yourself suffering right here and now. And being able to imagine yourself, one, not doing that, and then two, imagining the ways you can get to that goal. Experimenting with this, experimenting with that, different ways of breathing, different ways of conceiving the breathing, different ways of focusing the mind. There's a lot to play with here. And as long as you're fully engaged, you're bound to make discoveries. This is what the quality of citta is, intentness. It's not just a lot of effort. It's the intentness that comes when you're really absorbed in something, when you're really engrossed in something. When you find that what you're doing gives you satisfaction, the satisfaction of learning how to master this problem. You've got this very creative mind. How can you use it so it doesn't create problems? How can you use it to find those areas of experience that, where there is no creating going on? Not out of dullness. I mean, even dull people make create things all the time. This is what the mind does. It fabricates things, but they don't get engaged in trying to do it well. What we're looking for instead is just trying to see, is there a dimension that where there is no creation and yet there's total happiness? How do you find that? To some extent, there's a following of the instructions, but then there's an awful lot that has to do with just give this a try, give that a try. Because if you don't learn how, learn how to try things you've never tried before, you're never going to find anything new. 
That's why the element of play is so important.